Welcome to Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and we'd like to welcome you back for another night of live telescope views through our 11-inch Rasa. Tonight, we're starting a new list, a brand new catalog. It's called, mysteriously, The Secret Deep. I don't think this has anything to do with Halloween, but it does sound kind of mysterious, doesn't it? If you're following the channel, you know that we have been looking at the Caldwell objects. We covered all of those that we could cover in this season. Uh, we've also been looking at the Herschel 400. We got through all those that we could do in this season, just waiting for another season to come up so other objects will show up. And then we ended up doing the uh, Hidden Treasures list that Stephen James O'Meara also wrote. Uh, we did all of those that we could do in this season. So we finally got a hold of his last book in this series of Deep Sky Companions. And this particular catalog, 109 objects, is called The Secret Deep. And I think he got the name from the fact that most of these objects are kind of uh, exotic and not normally uh, viewed. So they're kind of like top secret objects in a way. And then he uses the word deep because they're all deep sky objects. Uh, it's an out of print book, so I doubt if very many folks maybe have it, or maybe it's it's on the shelf somewhere uh, at, in, in some of your uh, home offices or something. Um, apparently there are 23 open star clusters in this list, 38 galaxies, 11 globular clusters, 15 bright nebulae, 18 planetary nebulae, and then there's a supernova remnant uh, an asterism, a quasar, and a black hole. So I'm looking forward to starting in this list. Um, and uh, let's get going. First, I'm going to check here in our little monitoring deal here so we can make sure that you guys have good um, audio. So let's listen. Yep. Sounds like the audio is working, and there's Ricky. Good to have you here, Ricky. Welcome. Uh, okay, let's get going. I guess the first thing we should do is just say a quick word about our rig. We're running a, a Rasa 11. That's an 11-inch Lestron Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph Telescope. You can see it here inside of our PureTech um, Roloff Roof Observatory. It's a Telestation 2. Whoops, you can't see it yet. Can't, yeah, yeah. Uh, Telestation 2. And it's sitting on top of uh, an Ioptron CEM70G mount, which is on a, an, an 8 inch pier extender and then on a, an adjustable height pier. So the pier raises up and gets it above the roof line. The camera on the front of the Rasa is a ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro. You can see it there mounted to it. That big black collar is a, um, an Octopi Astro camera interface designed specifically for the Rasa 11. And the data, the, the data come out to this little uh, rig rack on top of maybe a, like an outrigger an outrigger on top of the telescope. It's made by Los Mandy. And on the front there, you see a little red camera. That delivers our sky views. And boy, the moon is bright tonight. It's about 100%. And it is lighting up the whole sky together with the Louisville light pollution. Uh, but then behind it are a couple of blue boxes. The one on top is the Pegasus Astro Power Box Micro. And the slightly bigger blue box underneath it is a USB controller also by Pegasus Astro. Those uh, send the data from the cameras and the scope, the mount it all down to this rig rack beside the bottom of the pier. And I think, in fact, if you look in this observatory, that's not a really good view of it. I wonder where else, there. To the bottom of that base now, where the pier is fastened onto the concrete pier, see that little black box down there that's fastened on the side. Well, that's this rig rack, and it has the 110 power coming in, the 12 volt power adapter, the 12 volt power distribution box, and also a, uh, a special controller that adapts the signal for, uh, 
fiber optic cable and we're sitting in a warm room about 200 feet from the actual observatory out there where the telescope is now viewing the sky as best it can under these circumstances. Um, the uh, telescope is right here and you can see it's aimed up because right now we're viewing uh, the secret deep object 99, SD99. It's NGC 6910. It's an open cluster in Cygnus. So let's look at that on the bigger screen. And here is that open cluster in the middle of the screen. It's a loosely packed cluster, isn't it? This is our first object. David, good to have you back from New Brunswick. I hope you're feeling better, David. I think you were kind of under the weather last night. I hope you're healing up. John, good to have you here from your observatory, Magdalena, New Mexico. Sorry about the monsoon clouds. Stu, welcome back from Tuaranga, New Zealand. Mid-afternoon and cloudy. Sorry about the clouds. Stu, we're glad to have you. Uh, DJ Mari, good to have you. I want you guys to know that tonight we've switched the comments, maybe you already noticed, so you have to be subscribed to be able to comment. So if some of you are noticing that, you do have to subscribe to comment. And the reason we did that is not to up the subscription list necessarily, although that would be a good thing. It's because of all these uh, pornography sites that are the bots, you know, the bots that are trolling all the YouTube video streams and commenting in their streams with these porn URLs. And I thought that was so rude and crude. So I hope by saying that they would have had to have subscribed, we make it a little more sophisticated and hopefully they won't know how to subscribe first and then comment. So we'll cut out those. Let's look up uh, briefly what Stephen James O'Meara writes about this uh, object. Dating bots, that's right, Ricky. Stu, this is NGC 6910, and it's uh, Secret Deep 99. Kim, good to have you back from Adelaide. It's been a while since I've seen you. Nice to have you on. Uh, it's been a long while since I've seen you, Kim. Good to have you here tonight. Let's see, 99. It's sometimes called the inchworm cluster. And uh, it is an open cluster in Cygnus. So let's go ahead and, and put this in our title up here, that it's NGC 6910. And let's also put it in our title down here. Let's see. How do I do this? Hmm, not that. Title on screen, here we go. No, title on screen, here we go. Um, this is uh, SD99, um, NGC6910, and open cluster in Cygnus. Okay. Uh, Stephen James O'Meara says that this was discovered by William Herschel in 1786. 5,000 light years away, has a diameter, uh, an arc, an arc minute, in, in terms of its extent, is 10 arc minutes wide. Uh, William Herschel wrote, it's a small cluster of coarsely scattered stars of various sizes. How did this William Herschel guy discover all these? In the NGC list, it describes it as a cluster, pretty bright, pretty small, poor, makes a cluster poor. Pretty compressed stars from 10th to 12th magnitude, uh, surrounded by many dark and bright nebulae, including IC 1318. Let's get a picture of where this is in the night sky. And to do that, we'll skip over here to Stellarium, our planetarium software. This lets us see different uh, constellations. And this little, this little blinking uh, square here that you might see right there, that blinking square is, um, is the position in the sky. You can see it's surrounded by a lot of different nebulae and it's in the northwestern direction, but it's pretty high up. It's about 87 degrees tonight. To find this, you would go to, um, maybe you could go to the 
the Little Dipper here and the Big Dipper, and you could look at the pointer stars next to the handle. And these two pointer stars would take you all the way through Draco, and then you see that there's the zenith where that Z is. So we're almost directly overhead. And when you get into this part of the sky, it's just amazing how much material there is. Let me click this and this will align our field of view. Look how much material there is. There, there's a huge uh, sort of a cloud of dust here and hydrogen alpha gas. So we're just looking at the, um, the cluster. So we won't image that cloud for right now. We just wanted to see the cluster. But you should know that behind it is this incredibly uh, big gas cloud of hydrogen. And anyway, it's um, this cluster is not related to any of that drama. See, any of, that, any of those clouds. It's uh, 5,000 light years away, so it's within our spiral arm of the galaxy. And these stars are very young, like 5 to 10 million years old, and about 66 stars shining here. He gives all the history of who discovered them, quite a lot of stuff that he writes here about it. Uh, So we're going to make an observation now. We're going to say it's 15 light years across. And what did we say? 66 stars. So we'll go over here and we'll say a new observation. And you can actually bring our observation window over here. We can say um, 66 light years across. Uh, how many thousand was it away? Uh, 5,000, I think. 5,000 light years distant. Uh, Stu says 125 stars. Probable members of the cluster. Plus 280 probable members located within the angular <clears throat> radius of the cluster. Great stuff, Stu. I'm going to put Stu as the source on that. You notice that our observations already picked up our session. I did that before we started. And all the equipment and everything is there. The moon is at 99%, but it's 70 degrees from this object. So pretty clear view on this cluster. So we will do a snapshot of this just so that we've got a, a view of it. and. That takes care of NGC 6910. So let's skip on to our next object. The next object is found by going to Hipparchus 98298. So let's slew to that. And I wonder why we're looking at a single star. I'm going to look up. Object 93. Oh, this is Cygnus X1. So down here in our in our um, title, we're going to say that this is SD93, and it's. Hipparchus 98-298. And that is Cygnus X1, associated with a black, black hole. OK, so. That should be Cygnus, the one in the bottom. Whoops, our, our view is not. So that would be the one for us on the left. Yes. 
right. So the one on the left is our Cygnus X1. Let's zoom in on that until it pixelates. That's about 175 degrees. So we're talking about right here. I don't think this will be, let's do a plate solve just to make sure, just to make sure we're viewing exactly the right, the right place. Uh, while that's happening, Stu says, Karchinko, Nevada, Piskunov, AE. Oh, all those people did a global survey of star clusters in the Milky Way. How interesting. There's your source. Okay, thanks. I'm not going to type all that in, those two. <laughs> uh, let's see. We were, oh yeah, we were within 0 0.03 degrees. So we were very close. Um, so it's this star right here, the one on the left, here in the middle. Cygnus X1. I'm just going to show this on the chart real quick. Oh, it's in the middle of that. It's in the middle of all that mess. Hmm. No chart. Oh, it's still, that's odd, isn't it? It won't move in this case. It must not know that star. Let's try to look this up real quick. Um, F3, oh, why is it not? There we go. Hipparchus 98298. Yes, so here's our star field. See these, uh, this pattern of uh, four stars? Now let's go over to the live view. And there's that pattern of those four stars. And there's our Cygnus, Cygnus X1. Parkas 98298. Cygnus X1 is a galactic X-ray source and the constellation Cygnus was the first such source widely accepted to be a black hole. Estimated to have a mass about 21.2 times the mass of the sun. So this is unique, isn't it? That on his list is a single star, but it's because you use the deep sky annotation option and tools and then you identify what's in the image. I don't think it'll do a single star, will it, uh, Green Cat? Let's find out though, but I don't think it'll do deep sky annotation for a star, no. It has to be like, a, an NGC object or something, you know? So sadly, that won't work. But, but this is it, and the reason I know that is because we plate solved, and that's right in the center of this frame. So that's our star right there. And then another reason why is because in Stellarium, we've identified these four stars here, and that matches those four stars there, and then here are these two stars, and there are these two stars. Cygnus X1 was the subject of a friendly scientific wager between physicists Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne in 1975 with Hawking betting that it was not a black hole. A black hole. He conceded the bet in 1990. Well, that's interesting. Okay, although we can't see a black hole through our telescopes, we can see its bright, visible light companion, if it has one, and use our imaginations to see the rest. Uh, Cygnus X1 is among the best and most well-known black hole candidates and the ninth magnitude companion is a cinch to see in even the smallest of telescopes, making it a fun target, one that can inspire deep thought when the, the area is shown to the public at star parties or to family and friends. Hmm. Look, this has 
that companion. But I, I have a feeling that this is the ninth magnitude companion, and that is our star. Yeah, because see how the crosshairs Yeah, that's our object. I've just never looked up a black hole before. <laughs> uh, the discovery of Cygnus X-1, the brightest X-ray source detected in Cygnus, was announced at a 1965 symposium. They gave a paper on it, and... They tracked the emission the radio emissions suddenly turned on in 1971, leading two teams to think that there had been a super giant there, but a bunch of people argued about that. Finally, in 73, talked about an X-ray emission that originated in a gas stream falling from a supergiant. Finally, they debated and figured out that it was the telltale sign of a black hole, flickering X-ray bursts on the order of one third of a second, which is the expected time frame of accreted matter descended, descending toward the dark star. But it's important to remember that a black hole has never been observed directly. It's a theoretical object predicted by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. So there's this event horizon, and it's, uh, you, it's like the rock group, the Eagles song, Hotel California. You can check in, but never leave. <laughs> I can't believe he wrote that in his scientific book here. So there is this artwork that somebody drew I'll see if I can show you this. That's what it might look like. Are you kidding? For real? Um, Kim says the star on the left is indeed Cygnus X1, aka V1357. And Stu says the compact object and blue supergiant star form a binary system in which they orbit around their center of mass every five days. Well, that's interesting, Stu. Evidence announced in 2011 suggested it's rotating extremely rapidly. 790 times per second. Wow! Jumping gigawatts, 60,000 gigawatts. That's incredible. Um, he talks about this companion. So basically, it's a black hole, it's a black hole star. In the astrophoto that he gives, you can see that it's basically our view that we have, and he labels it with the HDE number. So in our observation on this, let's just put that the Cygnus X1 rotates at 790 times per second. It's the companion star for a giant black hole. So I want to ask you guys that are here with us today, we've got about a dozen people here, have you guys ever observed a black hole before? Because I sure haven't. And right there in that star, I wish we could listen to it, don't you? But we can't, so there you go. All right, pushing on, we're gonna run our, kind of refresh our list here. And it looks like we have a planetary nebula here we could go see. This is NGC 7026. And it's 
SD101 NGC7026 and it is a planetary nebula in Cygnus. So we do have to do a meridian flip. That means now this object is at 80 degrees. We should have time to observe it. Notice our weights are east and the scope is now bending back and looking almost directly over. Oh my goodness, it is looking very, very vertical, isn't it? Hmm. Boy, just take a look at this star field. How many stars is that? Somebody take a guess. I mean, would it be a thousand stars that we're looking at without live stacking? Of course, we could see even more if we live stacked. SD, remember, stands for secret deep. So is that our planetary right there? Okay, either way, let's go to our 20 seconds and our, our, our gain of 100. And let's change this name to NGC7026. And it looks like, oh, I think I see it. It's so tiny. Right in the middle. Clear our livestock. Look at that moonlight. Wow. Ricky counted them. 1,267 he got. <laughs> Maybe use astrometry.net or whatever the site is. But certainly there were a lot of stars there. All right. We're going to do a um, color balance. Where is our planetary? Is that it? This white thing? Or is this it? Oh, Larry, good to have you aboard. Larry counted 1,333. He's got better eyes than you do, Ricky. <laughs> Ricky said, don't trust my number. I'm terrible at math. Tell you what, let's, let's come back out at full screen. And we should be able to use the um, deep sky image annotation on this. No. Oh, look. It's off a little bit. It could not possibly be over there. Could it? Could it? I think our deep, our image annotation is warped. Hmm. Well, that just looks like starlight there. See the diffraction spikes? But this could be it. That looks like it has a little bit of a hollow core. wonder why our image annotation let us down. Maybe because we... Um, what do you say we... we plate solve, but solve only again? And so we won't, in other words, we're not resyncing the mount. And GC7026 is 6,000, yeah, here we go, 6,000 uh, light years away. We're looking for a cloud, not a point. Yeah, so we re-plate solved, and this time we got a lot better, and we identified this as Hipparchus. So it identified that star. So this is our 
planetary nebula. Boy, it is so tiny, isn't it? Wow. It has a neat little structure around it, though. I'm going to kind of go in now. Let me get this uh, image annotation off the screen. I'm going to kind of go into some of the digital zoom until we start seeing that pixelation. Take a look at that structure around it. Isn't that interesting? So this is uh, 101. 101. SD 101. Some people call it the Cheeseburger Nebula. <laughs> Others call it Burnham's Nebula. It was discovered by Shelburne Burnham in 1873. Herschel didn't see this. NGC has it as being pretty bright, binuclear, annular, or ring nebula. Mm -hmm. It's another nebulous marvel tucked away in a rich expanse of the Milky Way. And he tells the location, it took a sharp-eyed American astronomer, Shelburne Burnham, to spy the new nebula on July 6, 1873. He did it in a six-inch refractor. I think, uh, Kim, I think you have a six-inch refractor, if I remember right. Stu says an analysis of Gaia data suggests that the central star of the planetary nebula is a binary system. That would explain why the uh, uh, ejected material around it is kind of oval instead of circular. Because if it's a binary system, it was warped by the gravity of the two stars. And then he tells the uh, history of Burnham and how he discovered this, and then other people that have gone back and forth. And then he says that its hot central star has a distinct wolf riot spectrum which means it's probably indeed binary bowed and let's see Let's see. Um, boy, if we had a little more focal length to zoom in on this, it is very unique. With our Rasa, you know, and our, what is it, 640, I think, focal length, we're not uh, zoomed in very tight on this before we go to pixelating, but it's such a small, it's only 21 arc seconds wide. <laughs> this is, you know how the sky is divided into 180 degrees that we can see on one side, 180 degrees. Each degree is divided into 60 minutes and then each minute is divided into 60 seconds. This is just 21 arc seconds. So it's a third of an arc minute, which is a 60th of a degree. This is tiny, but still it's great to be able to see it. And let's zoom in a little more. The surface temperature of known wolf ray at stars, Stu says, range from 20,000 Kelvin to 210,000 Kelvin, hotter than almost all other kinds of stars. Let's see if we can uh, pump up our mids a little more and let's zoom in as much as we can before you can see a little bit of the hollowed out portion but that's about it um, other than that we're just seeing the fact that this is an oval shaped it almost looks like a Saturn like a little UFO flying saucer, sort of, with a bright core. Let's do our observation. And we'll say this planetary is tiny. 21 arc seconds 
of extent. Stu said it had a binary center. Curtis, good to have your board. It's great to see you on. I'm sorry I'm not on cloudy nights anymore. Because I was always promoting something, they thought I was a vendor, and I went down the wrong path, and they kicked me off cloudy nights because they didn't think I was playing fair. And I didn't say anything to hurt anybody. I was just, they always thought I was marketing something. And the trouble is, I wasn't marketing anything to sell. I was just trying to launch things, you know, ideas and marathons and club meetings and boy, it went down the wrong path. And so I'm so sorry I'm not on cloudy nights anymore. I regret that, but they, they ejected me. Uh, we couldn't see, we couldn't make out the central stars, but we could barely see the, uh, what would you call that? The, the empty core inside the oval shell. That's the tiniest planetary I've ever seen. Let's do a save of this and we will now use this sequencer the rest of the night and it automates so much of the process. Let's uh, refresh our list and go to another planetary in Cygnus. I'm saying Cygnus, not sickness. In Cygnus and in health, uh, you see our scope kind of repositioning there to the next planetary, and this one is SD96. SD96, <clears throat> NGC 6894, NGC 6894, and it's a planetary nebula in Cygnus as well. What we did is a meridian flip there. Now the weights are going to be west. Curtis says, don't worry, I understand. So you probably heard of that kind of thing. Hubble has a spectacular photo. Is that a photo of the planetary? that we just saw. NGC 7026, I bet you're saying. This is um, 6894, NGC 6894. Well, I don't think our sequence it had an error. I wonder if I messed up the sequence programming. I was trying to uh, add guiding. Set the display zoom level. Stop live stacking. Uh, stop periodic dithering. That's what it was. Stop guiding. Yeah. Okay. Let's save this now. And it should work next time. Sorry about that. I wonder if I can just start live stacking now. Oh, maybe we do um, plates of. Yep, the last one. Azra, good to have you on board from Arizona. All right, so remind me, Stu, you're saying that was uh, NGC 7026. NGC 7026. Oh my goodness, that is beautiful. Look at that. Wow. And there is one central star, but I don't see a second one. But look how it's double lobed. That's why it had that flying saucer. See what we were seeing here? The flying saucer appearance was this reddish glow. It's amazing. Thanks so much for calling our attention to that, Stu. That is beautiful indeed. Okay, so we evidently did our plate solve, I'm trusting. And clear this.
Looks like hands grabbing a hamburger. <laughs> yeah, you should, you should write into Steve O'Meara and name it that, Stu. Recommend that name for him. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Hands grabbing hamburger. Let's look at the... Um, Yeah, it's supposed to be right there in the middle. Oh, I see it. Wow, that one is beautiful. Beautiful. Jessica! This is my niece, everybody. Jessica's here. Welcome, Jessica. Uh, he called it the Cheeseburger Nebula. I guess he already stole your idea, Stu. Isn't that amazing? Now, <clears throat> do you guys think that? That is not the central star, I bet. I bet that's a foreground star. There's an object right in the middle. I bet that's the central star. Boy, we are getting a lot of good out of this digital zoom. This is 96. Secret Deep 96. The Diamond Ring. Ah, the Diamond Ring Nebula. <laughs> That's great because he's he's saying that that ring in the in the shell is actually like a diamond in a ring. It's five thousand light years away, forty two arc seconds wide. Herschel discovered it. How did he do this? In seventeen eighty four. How did he do this? It's a sizable but dim planetary nebula, at least for a five inch telescope. And he tells the location, he tells the history people discovering it. It has two attached shells, the outer one of which is peculiar. Apparently, planetaries fall into three morphological categories, round, elliptical, and butterfly. They're further described by the relative proximity of the bright inner rims to the central planetary nucleus. And then he tells about this guy named Bruce Balick at the University of Washington, Seattle, classifies NGC 6894 as middle round. Hmm. 5,000 light years. The shell extends one light year across space. It lies 230 light years below the galactic plane where the galactic magnetic field is parallel to the galactic plane. What? The galactic magnetic field is parallel to the galactic plane. Didn't have light pollution to deal with, so easy to see the night sky. Ah, oh, you're thinking that's why William Herschel could discover it. That's a good theory, Azray. We're going to go with that. That way I won't feel quite as guilty for how well he did with his 18-inch telescope back then. Um, there are stripes, hmm, four major stripes. Do they extend out from the object? Let me get my pointer out of the way. And let's bump up the mids a little bit. See if we can see any stripes. Um, talks about how to find it. He couldn't see it at first in his five inch scope. 
when he used all of the star hopping, he finally saw it with 165 power eyepiece. It was at the very limit of the five inch scope under a very dark sky. Boy, I am not gonna tell you guys. Okay, I'm gonna tell you. I am so happy we have an 11 inch scope because look, we're seeing the central star begin to show up. The central star is beginning to form here. And he couldn't even see it in his five inch refractor. I'm so happy we have an 11 inch scope. Uh, he says um, there's a 14th magnitude star on the northwest side of the nebulous ring shining like a precious jewel. He says if you look long enough you can see red in the ring. So it's been called the engagement ring, but that's already associated with something else. He says in an eight inch, the, the outer shell has no discernible detail. I think the outside does have some detail. You know, electronically assisted astronomy just kills. I mean, it's it's so much better than visual. I bet he didn't find it on a full moon night either. You're right, Stu. 100% moon. Let's take a look real quick at the sky cam. Oh my goodness, that's our sky. Where is this object and all that light? My goodness. <laughs> There's the moon you can see at the very top of the image. The moon is just like a giant beacon, but yet somehow we're seeing this. So this is uh, 5,000 light years and it's uh, 42 arc seconds. I'm gonna do our little observation here. Five thousand light years, forty-two arc seconds of extent but it showed up nicely in our 11 inch scope using EAA. We could easily make out the central star lighting up the uh, outer shell which had multiple dark um, regions. We could see the uh, diamond in the, um, whatever we call this, the wedding ring? No, engagement ring. Um, the outer shell seemed coarse around the edges, probably due to an outer glow that we could pick up, we, we could likely, we would likely pick up if we imaged for a longer integration, but we're not going to. But let's see what this looks like in a Hubble photo, NGC 6894. NGC 6894. Wikidata, Wikipedia. Oh yeah, that's pretty much what we were seeing except we didn't see these little stars here that were in the foreground, but we could tell that this hollowed portion was there and we saw the central star. And look how we were picking up this coarse edge and that's because of that outer halo. Beautiful, isn't it? Wayne, good to see you. Great to have you on board from wild, wonderful West Virginia. Well, that's a beautiful image. Whoever did this, looks like this was, um,
Mount Lemmon, the Schulman Telescope. Mount Lemmon. Well, it's a beautiful image, isn't it? I mean, for a 100% moonlit night, I just kind of want to pause here for one moment and say, let's don't ever fall into the trap of thinking that we can't do EAA observations on a 100% full moon night. Because this is a faint nebula and it's tiny. But using electronically assisted astronomy in just 10 minutes, we have this image. It's really nice. By the way, I'll do a little um, screenshot of this in a closer up view, maybe something like this, a couple of stars there for context. And we'll name this I'll name this NGC 6894, and we'll say 11 minutes, 33 subframes, and we'll say on 2022, 10-9, um, and you know what else we can do is in our observation, oh rats, I already, I already saved that so it already made it disappear from my view. So we'll ignore for a second and rerun this uh, seven or 6894, here it is. And let's edit this because what I want to do is attach the picture. Look how you can say images and then go grab the image NGC 6894. Four. and it puts the image there for you in the observation. So that's kind of fun, isn't it? Uh, this is Deep Sky Planner. I kind of like this better than Astro Planner, of course, better than Starry Night Pro for observing, better than anything else I found for observing. And I just did a, a kind of a, a review on it last night. You can find on the channel, Emerald Hill Skies on the YouTube channel. It's a 90 minute workflow deep dive review of, of uh, Deep Sky Planner if you'd like to learn more. This is all we'll say about it tonight, but do look at that 90 minute review if you like. We go through our workflow in detail and we demo how to add uh, like observing plans and how you uh, filter for those. Really a deep dive. I think if you're interested in this kind of software, it is it is pretty interesting. Now we'll go back and filter these again, show us just the ones we haven't observed that are above our local horizon model right now. So that's what this refresh did. Let's go to the next object and for that we'll try our sequencer again. Mount Lemons too said yes. And next target, we'll see if this will run this time. Yeah, this is better. Our next target is an open cluster. It's NGC 7209. NGC 7209. NGC 7209. And it's 
SD105. 105 NGC 70, 7209 and it's um, an open cluster in what is LAC? LAC Lackadaisical Lack 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 Lacerta. Lacerta. This is the first thing we've ever observed in Lacerta. How exciting. A new constellation for observing. Uh, has the mount settled? Yes. So now we'll click this and it'll do our plate solve. NGC 7209. Let's see where this is in our planetarium software. We'll go like this and say, show chart. And it'll uh, automatically tune the chart up to this object in Lacerta. Here's Lacerta, sure enough. It's this little uh, parallelogram deal here with a little tail. And right above it, there you see the Rasa kind of tuning up to right there. And there's the Rasa field of view this is the predicted field of view. And so the cluster is right here. Okay, let's go back to the live view now. And there we are. Lots of uh, members there, huh? This is, uh, Stu says, 3,810 light years away from Earth. It's made up of 150 stars, magnitude 9 to 15. 3,810. Yep, that agrees pretty well with what Omira said. Of course, your data is more up to date, Stu. This book was actually published around 2000, if I remember right, 2011. So this is about 11 years old. Your data is more up to date. So how about that? More up to date than Stephen James O'Meara's data. It's a large and loose open cluster. Lacerta means the lizard. So we call it the star lizard. Is that what we really call it? That doesn't sound like a... It doesn't sound like a really good name to me. Uh... It appeared first in a star atlas in 1690. Havelius talks about it. It's about 150 stars. Yeah, that's what Stu said. And it's spread across 15 arc minutes. Boy, for some reason, our little, our little deal didn't disappear this time. We're not live stacking. It must have hit another error. Oh, well. We really don't have to live stack this, do we? Because that's a pretty good picture, isn't it? Oh, we can live stack it a little bit just while we're... So our sequence still has some kind of error in it, I bet. Um, it has an eclipsing binary, 14 days. And it's supposed to be beautiful and conspicuous with no central concentration. Has a beautiful hook shape. Extremely rich in starlight, but not all the stars are cluster members. So the cluster actually looks almost twice as large as it really is. Take your time with it. He says, I see many skeletal and spidery forms. Maybe this would be a good cluster to show family and friends on Halloween. <laughs> oh, really? A lot of data on the Wikipedia is credited to Stephen James O'Meara. Azra is going to go do astrophotography. Well done, Azra. So it's uh, 3350, 3810, Stu says. 
Boy, I tell you what, it is a, really quite the cluster, isn't it? It is beautiful. Let's do a um, bit of a white balance and bring our darks to right there. And then let's bring up our mids. And you know, if it's not my imagination, we can even see some nebulosity there. A little bit of a cloud of dust around some of these. Maybe I just have the blacks too low. Let's bring them up to right there. Might still be some, some clouds of dust. Sure is a beautiful cluster though, isn't it? What shape do you guys see? This is an interesting shape, isn't it? Kind of looks like um, the shape of racing goggles. <laughs> Here's a chair. Here's a uh, horse. Excuse me. This is something here. I don't know what that shape is. Beautiful cluster, though. NGC 7209. Someday I've got to look up why that doesn't save its place. NGC 7209 at 3 minutes and 10 frames on 2022 10.09, 10.09, NGC 7.209. Hello, Papa Tech. Good to see you here. Got clouds again tonight, Papa Tech? 150 members, 38, 10 light years distant. Mag 9 to 15, according to Stu. Um, Lots of cool shapes. Lots of cool connect the dot shapes. And then we'll go to images here, see, and we'll go to NGC. Actually, I could just type it in here, couldn't I? NGC 7209. Oh, look, I have this before. And now we've got an image saved there. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Oh, we have to save up here, too. Okay. Anyway, nice open cluster. Thank you, Steve O'Meara. All right, now let's look at our sequence real quick here and see if we can solve this error that it must have had. Set the display zoom level to zero. Stop live stacking. Set the exposure to 3, 400. Use that. Let's just get rid of that. And let's get rid of this and that. Set the Indy 400, prompt for the target name, plate solve, wait 25 seconds, set the gain to 100, exposure to 20 seconds. Uh, get rid of that. Oh, it didn't save our... Um, let's say auto stretch, high progress and successful. Let's 
save. Do you think it saved it? I hope so. All right, let's try it. Um, next target. All right, let's rerun this. I wonder if we can do this asterism. Why are we going to an asterism, Stephen J. Romero? Okay, Parkus 98, 943 is the star that's helping us find it. But we'll call it SD94 because it won't be anywhere else named anything else. So it's Secret Deep 94. It's what the asterism is going to be called. Oh, Puppetech, you fell while climbing rocks and ended up destroying your shoulder. I am so sorry to hear that. And your arm. So is it in a cast? So sorry. Jessica saw a lizard. Well, we'll have to get you a marker and let you connect the dots and show us. Let's do the same stars in the lizard constellation were chosen by Chinese astronomers to form Ting Shi, the flying serpent. <laughs> nice. Okay, the mount is settled. So now we click this OK. And this is an asterism. What is the asterism, Stephen James Romero? 94. He calls this Omira 3. I see. See that cluster in the middle? It's actually not a cluster. It's just a gathering of stars. So what he did is he gave it a name. <laughs> Stu. Stu's telling Papa Tech to get a setup like Doug so you can sit inside recovering and still observe. Wayne, look like a dragon. What you called a chair look like the head. Ah, oh, nice, Wayne. Oh my goodness, look at all these stars. Let's see you count these, Ricky. What he did, he named this the Little Ladle. See how this is the handle? Of course, it's upside down now, dipping out the, what do you put in a ladle, gravy? Oh, I'm so sorry, scope view. Thanks for telling us, Stu. See this little ladle handle here, and there's the, the dipper, and he's dumping the maple syrup out of the little ladle. So that is the prize. <laughs> it was discovered by Bruno Alessi in 1997, an Italian astronomer, and rediscovered independently by Steve O'Meara in 2009. So he calls it O'Meara 3. So let's change the title name down here before we forget here. This is um, SD94. And asterism 
and Cygnus. Now I actually worked on this the other day, just a little bit, this object. Because since it's not listed in any of the um, catalogs, you can't search for it and locate it. So what I did is I looked up the center star here at the handle where the handle meets the cup and that's Hipparchus 98943. And I did that by using uh, Deep Sky Planner to talk to Stellarium. And then I clicked on these stars until I found a central star that would line us up. And sure enough, Hipparchus 98943 is the guide star. So 98943. So let's, in our observation of this, let's say... Steve O'Meara calls this asterism O'Meara 3, which obviously isn't in any catalog for Stellarium either. So we find it by searching for Hipparchus 98943 and I needed that I needed that star in order for Deep Sky Companion to be able to find it. It's what are we going to call this guys? We're going to call this uh, it's cute. How about that? <laughs> the little ladle. Well, that's probably enough of the little ladle. I guess we should do a picture of it. And we're going to call this SD90. Oops, I already saved it. SD94. Um, And put it in here. Okay. Next object. Let's go to, let's run our, refresh our list. Here's another planetary nebula. Let's catch that. It's NGC 7354 NG, uh, SD 106 NGC 7354 a planetary nebula in Cepheus I think is what that is He's discovered a few of these, almost enough to call them the Omerisms. <laughs> Stu saw an ice pick. A Minecraft pickaxe. That's good, Stu. Papatek. Stu, no funds to get that nice setup up and going. You're very kind, Papatek. Stu, me neither, so I'm living vicariously through that. <laughs> you, you, guys are, you guys are very kind. We've got about 20 people on. If you have not uh, identified yourself, we'd love to have you just uh, point out, if you don't mind, where you're observing from and maybe your first name would be great to be able to, the scope has settled. It would be great to know where you're observing from if you haven't done that. Papa Tech says, me too. So sorry about the arm and shoulder. So is this in a, is this in a sling or a cast or what, Papa Tech? We are so sorry to hear about this. Okay, so you see the weights are now up to the east and the scope is pure west. And that's what we saw when we 
when we um, plate solved. You know, I think I'm seeing the slightest little... But we are definitely getting hit by the moon, aren't we? My goodness. I do see a little splotch there in the middle that I think we'll be able to see. This is uh, 106. Wow, this looks like a great planetary nebula. Again, discovered by William Herschel. This guy, pretty bright, small, irregularly round. ER, almost equally bright. It's a neglected planetary nebula in a rather inconspicuous part of Cepheus, the king. He tells where it is. William Herschel discovered it, classified as a faint nebula. It wasn't identified as a planetary, meaning that it looked small and round like the planet Uranus until 1862 when Lord Rossi at Burr Castle in Ireland saw it in his great 72-inch reflector. Wow! And then he tells a little more of the history. It's a very complex nature, bright and clumpy inner and slightly regular oval ring or torus. I'm gonna just slide the darks over here and then bring up the mids just a little and then let's zoom in. We'll stop there right now. Um, it's 4,200 light years, 0.6 light year across. It's like a symmetrical egg or American football. Huh. Twenty two arc seconds of extent. Cometary structures in the Hubble Space Telescope image. Cometary structures have a bright head. And that's weird. There's a halo and a ring system. And it tells you how to find it. 28,000 light years from the galactic center, about 170 light years above the galactic plane. If you're using a five inch refractor, you have to use um, averted vision. The outer nebula is egg-shaped with beaded inner rings. A roughly magnitude 13.5 star is very close to the nebula's southwest edge. Can be mistaken for a detail if insufficient magnification is used. Boy, he sure gives lots of good history. 28,000 light years from the galactic center. We're going to have to go look at the Hubble to see this. Because... It is just nothing but brightness, isn't it, for us? I wonder if we actually dial down the mids, if we'll see more structure. It just looks disc-like, doesn't it? We're not seeing any of the inner... Of course, we've only been integrating data for four minutes. No cast, Papatek says. 
bruised and muscle issues, constant back spasms. Well, we're glad you don't have to do a cast, but we're sorry about the back spasms and everything else. We couldn't make out much structure at all. Mostly, it did look like a planetary disk. Stu said it was 5,500 light years away and binary in the center. Could have been worth. Somebody was watching over. Well, I'm sure glad to hear that, Papa Tech. Maybe there's a little stripe there. Boy, couldn't you imagine how somebody would have thought this was a planet? Has a little ring, doesn't it? More blue, less yellow. Okay. That's Stu. More blue, more cowbell, less red. Huh, it almost looks like Jupiter and that's an equatorial band. Okay, let's go look at the, um, this is NGC 7354. GC 7354. 7354. Oh my goodness. You know what we're seeing? We're seeing those hydrogen clouds in front of it. That's what we were identifying as that equatorial band. Isn't that wild? Boy, I can see, Stu, why you wanted to see more blue. We do want more cowbell, don't we? Hmm. No, oh, <laughs> that's too much blue. That's so fun that we could see those, that band of those clouds without the Hubble. Who needs the Hubble? Just kidding. <laughs> it is beautiful, isn't it? Very mysterious. We, let's see, we could make out what looked like an equatorial band on Jupiter, which was actually swirls of H alpha and dust uh, floating around the middle. Oh boy, we'll take a picture of this. Eight minutes, 26 subs on 2022, October 9th. I wonder if we No. Gotta 
do it with the folder. I wonder if I just sorted these by the latest. It would always be at the top then, because I have them. Seventy-three, fifty-four. Pretty cool. this. Boy, it's nice to have some new objects, isn't it? This is Planetary Nebula Night, 6905. A smoky shell writes to Dark Meta. Good to have you back. <laughs> Stu says, hey, Dark. <laughs> it's like you guys are Best friends, 6905. Man, are we going to lose this in, a, in the moon? Hmm. Man. It's like as bright as day, isn't it? Excuse me. I don't know why I'm yawning. Oh, there are some stars. Okay, so the mount looks like it is settled, so we'll click OK. Ninety-eight. NGC sixty-nine zero five. Also known as the Blue Flash Nebula, is a planetary nebula in the constellation Delphinius. Ninety-eight SD ninety-eight NGC sixty-nine oh five Delph. Delphin, Delphinus, Delphinus, Delphinus. Sixty-nine oh five. William Herschel. Pretty bright, perfectly round, pretty well defined. It's 5,870 light years away. That observation. Right there in the middle of the screen it is. 5,870 light years away. 42 arc seconds. Of extent. Bright, small. So much moonlight. Okay, Ricky, let's uh, get a count on the number of stars here that you see. You know what I did today, gang? I um, went out to the observatory in the afternoon and I wrapped the 
ZWO ASI 2600 Pro, see how it's red and shiny? And it's red and shiny on the sides. And I got thinking, when the moon shines on that, I bet it creates a little bit of halo. So I wrapped it in a, an adhesive black felt. And you know, it was easy. It only took 15 minutes to do it. And now you can't get the moon, you know, glimmering off of it anymore. So kind of happy. It's a hundred, uh, hundred percent right there. I don't know how you, hey, there's a central star though. Let me go ahead and go digitally in, unless that's a foreground star. But look how that star is right in the center. Two thousand six hundred forty-one stars, Ricky says. Way more than that, Stu says. He's up to ten thousand and still counting. It's a beautiful planetary nebula in the Delphinus Milky Way near the borders of Volpecula and Sagitta. At low powers, it looks like a hint of lint in a carpet of stars. <laughs> a hint of lint. Okay, let's go back and see this hint of lint idea. Oh, it doesn't look like a hint of lint. Sorry, Steve O'Meara, I disagree. Boy, it has got a slight green tinge to it, doesn't it? A hint of lint, misty, ill-defined, fascinating fur bowl of dappled light in a tight trapezium of equally bright suns that continually plays with and confuses the eye. Trapezium would be these four stars here that make a kind of a... What would you call that? To suspend from, you know, like a trapeze for a circus, a circus act. Um, it's a curiosity. An unusual high excitation nebula with conical outflow lobes Oh my goodness, I think we're starting to see the lobes. Look, look at that edge there and this edge. Let's go ahead and make it bigger, even though structurally it's gonna start, you know, pixelating, but look at this lobe here, sticking out of the, of the nebula, trapezoid. Currently about 60% the mass of the sun before becoming a planetary nebula, it had a mass of 1.07. Would that be million or a thousand? Another Wolf Ray at Central Star with a guesstimated surface temperature of one, 150, is that 150,000 Kelvin? I like it that we can see the central star. It's a variable. It tells how to find it. <clears throat> the eye is drawn to it. Talks about depth perception. Depth perception. 
that if you keep zooming in, it'll seem 3D. I like that we can see the star, but the star is a little bit too bright now. It lost about 40% of its mass when it exploded. 1M is the sun's mass. Ah, oh, one mass, I get it. I get it. You know, I think we see more structure when we drop the mids down and make it a little bit dimmer. Now we're seeing more greens too. You too, Wayne. Thanks for stopping by. This is NGC 6905. And it's uh, seven minutes, 23 frames. be able to just put our cursor here and say NGC 6905. There we go. Okay. Well, we'll re shift. These have been great targets, haven't they? I love the fact that we're back in business here after running out of things in the other catalogs. Let's do another planetary nebula. 6891. NGC 6891. It's SD95. Another planetary nebula in Delphinus. Mount has settled. Boy, the moon is so blinding. Are we really going to be able to observe here? Excuse me. Tells about the history of finding it. Exclusive triple shell planetary nebulae. There's a bright inner shell surrounded by a circular intermediate shell and a nearly symmetrical outer halo. It's 12,400 light years and the true linear extents are half a light year, one light year, and five light years respectively. Oh, right there it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? 
Look at how many stars. My goodness. This looks a lot like the other, the other nebula that we were observing, doesn't it? It looks very, very similar. We did slew, didn't we? Or did we just start in the same spot? Did we slew? Let's do an image annotation. 6905. I bet we didn't slew. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Probably getting sleepy. We ran this um, next target deal and then evidently didn't slew. We slew it. It does look very similar. Oh, okay. Discovered on September 22nd, 1884 by the English astronomer Ralph Copeland. One of the shells is 4,800 years old, while the outer halo is 28,000 years old, indicating a series of outbursts from the dying star at different times. It's cold out there tonight. I uh, believe, oh, it's about 43 so far. Not terribly cold. It, it got down to like 34 degrees overnight, but so far it's just 43. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so sorry, Stu. I tell you what, I need to get my muscle memory set up so that I, I get a routine going. I always put it back in screen view instead of that scope view. Sorry. It reminds me of a kind of an eyeball. Two faint knots can be seen at either end. Looks like you need to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I think I will. This is my third night in a row doing, <laughs> doing astronomy. I got carried away because we had three clear nights in a row. Boy, isn't this a beautiful patch of the sky. Very tiny planetary nebula. Look at that. So bright. Man, we're not going to see much on this one, are we? So sad. No matter what we do, it's just so bright. Um, the outer shell is also nearly circular, but it bulges to the south where it appears to break and form a spearheaded outer structure. Hmm. That's interesting about the different ages of the shells. Kimberly, good to have you on board from Florida. <laughs> Curtis says, take all the nights you can get. Yes, but Stu is right. I'm going to have to sleep sometime. OK, 
Okay, then he tells you how to find it. It looks bloated at higher powers. He couldn't resolve the inner shell into an ellipse. Wonder how much time we would need to do that. Stu, I actually like uh, what you gathered there. That's so interesting about the different ages of the ejected material. Stu noted that one of the shells had ejected 4,800 years ago, while the outer halo is said to be 28,000 years old, a series of outbursts. from the dying star at different times. Man. I don't know how. to see the inner core. Oh, I see. If we put the mids way over there and we look just at the inside, now it's starting to look oblong. Let's look at the Hubble image. 6891. Oh my goodness, that is gorgeous. Okay, I'm inspired now. <laughs> Backing down the reds, pumping up the blues. Man, we can't go much higher than that. Hmm. No, not much structure there after five minutes. It just looks like a kind of an airy disc. Uh huh. Stu's right. Maybe come back. Apertures around 10 inches and very dark skies are usually needed if you want to pick up the 14th magnitude central star on the bluish outer halo. You're right. I'll write that in here, Stu. That's a good idea. We'll have to come back at less of a moon lit night and stay longer on this object to see the inner halo. Good thinking, Stu. Stu, I'm curious, how long have you been observing? I wonder how many years Sometimes you come across as a pretty experienced, I don't even want to say amateur anymore. Well, we'll say goodbye to 6891 and run this again. In the meantime, we'll, I think we've got our sequence working again. All right. Um, let's try this diffuse nebula. It's 
classified as V like Victor, D like Delta, VDB1, and he's got the, the V and the D are in small letters, and then the V is a capital, so it's VDB1, like Victor, Delta, Bravo, and it is secret, deep, object number one a diffuse nebula in Cassiopeia. So we'll go down here. We'll say SD1 VDB1 a diffuse nebula in Cassiopeia. Well, this is what you get on 100% moonlit night. You get a sky that looks like that. I got my first telescope when I was 14, a six inch reflector, but I've only been a keen but incompetent amateur. I don't have the patience to sit outside on cold nights. Well, you know, I tried that around 2002 or 2003 with a, an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain one of those old Celestron 8-inch, CPC-8, I think they called it. And man, I probably did a dozen nights if I did any. And I'm the same. I just, I just didn't enjoy the aloneness and the creepy feeling of being out by myself. I didn't enjoy the cold, damp feeling that I constantly had. And the views were just faint, fuzzies. I just had trouble liking it. So I put that telescope in a closet and didn't get it out until a year and a half ago when a homeschool group asked me to come and bring it. They knew I had a telescope. They asked me to come and bring it to show them the heavenlies. Oh, it was hard because I couldn't get them all around the eyepiece at once. So finally, I... I guess one of the moms walked by, and a friend of mine, and she said, doesn't it have a screen? <laughs> I was so insulted. I remember thinking, a screen? And I hadn't even looked into astronomy lately. This was just a year and a half ago. So I started looking into it, and I found out, not only can you do a screen now, you can live stream a screen. <laughs> so... Unfortunately, I got my start in EAA. Boy, this might not be a great night for this diffuse nebula. I don't like admitting, I don't like sitting out on moonlit nights Stu said, which is why I'm enjoying this so much. Oh, that's so nice of you, Stu. Spaced Out says, I like to just point my equipment out my car's window in the winters. <laughs> Spaced Out, where do you image from? Where, where's your town? I don't recognize. can't remember where you... Um... Stu, telescope and screen, such a winning combination. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, are we seeing a little nebulosity right there in the middle among those three little stars? Vanderberg 1. It's a little known reflection nebula. And that's exactly what it is. It's that little white glow among those three little stars in the center. Let's zoom in on those babies. Look at that. Would you look at that? 
Kim, our local astronomy club is holding a public stargazing event later this week. At least half the telescopes will be set up for EAA with screens nearby. It's the way to go, Kim, especially with those groups. And you have a lot of uh, light pollution there in those, you know, city squares. I remember you showing us that before. Wow, even in this moonlight, look at the way we're picking up that nebulosity. And isn't it interesting that it's white? Um, tells about the history of it. Reflection Nebula associated with 500 different stars out of the 100,000 that this guy named Sidney Vandenberg. He did a catalog of reflection nebula, nebulae. He talked about other catalogs. This one he said, it's a five arc minute long wash of cerulean light surrounding bright illuminating stars. The hue rivals the azure sheen of the Murot Nebula in the Pleiades star cluster. So it's supposed to be blue. Well, we're just going to try to bump up the blues a little bit. Not that much, mind you. <laughs> Okay, there's a little blue shimmer now. Boy, you don't want the whole sky to turn blue though, do you? There. Why don't we see if we can get that by bringing down the reds? tricky, isn't it? Oh my goodness, that's too much green. <laughs> you know you can hold your shift key down and move these, can't you? Oh no, you can't do those. That must just be on the histogram. Stu says, can you access your telescope from anywhere or do you have to be in that room? Great if you could take your laptop to the school presentation and live stream from your own scope. You know there's an IT guy here who said we ought to do it that way, but I didn't listen to him. I just did it via fiber optic cable because I thought the internet would be a little too slow. Oh, there we go. I could just barely see it. Uh, but he said we should have done it via the web. But silly me, I didn't. I just used fiber optics. So you can only do it at the scope or in here. You remember uh, out there at the observatory, see there on the left, on the wall, I've got a screen mounted with a little fold-down desk table thing. I don't know if you can see it better in, um, let's see. See that little chair by the back wall? And that is a screen. So I can sit there and tune it out by the scope, like when I'm adjusting the uh, Octopi Astro interface, but otherwise the only other place to observe would be here. We are picking up this glow even though it's a moonlit night. It does remind us of that Cassiopeia glow, doesn't it? It's a foggy glow, Elmira says. And those three stars are ninth magnitude. It burns through the nebula like light seen through the fog. Oh my goodness, he writes a lot about this. How do you write so much about a little patch of fog? Hmm. 
basically what he urges you to do is to is to go through Vandenberg's that's what the VDB stands for go through Vandenberg's catalog and try to image these all we could easily make out the um, Azure <laughs> we'll use Omira's and I'll credit Omira with that term Azure glow between these three ninth mag stars we were surprised we could still see it on a 100% full moon lit night like M45 Stu, always listen to your IT guy. He knows best, usually. <laughs> yeah. It was just going to make it more complicated, and I just wanted to get going. And honestly, I don't mind observing from here and then using a YouTube stream. It's all the same to me. But uh, I, I know I get your point. I, I understand, but I don't mind it. So this is VD, VDB1. And this is uh, nine minutes, um, 27 frames. VDB1. So I'll just put this here in the, in the image. So I'll get this little two-step dance. VDB one, and then I'll uh, click here. There's that glow. It really is interesting, isn't it? All right. Well, this is where we'll end. It is uh, eleven o'clock. John, it's kind of you to encourage. Uh, Stu, thank you. You're very kind to uh, say nice things about these lists. You're very kind. As you can see, we have. Uh, I'll just bring this over if I can. We have, uh, I'll bring it over, there we go. We have another, um, on a night like tonight, we have another 25 objects that we can image. So if we do somewhere around 10 or 12 a night, this will be another two or three nights. And then hopefully there will be some come up in the other catalogs. So thanks again for your uh, kindness to join us tonight. And if you're watching this recording, uh, we appreciate you doing that. If you've not subscribed yet, we would love that because it helps uh, people find the channel. If you like content like this, please do click that thumbs up. Again, it just helps bubble up this channel so other people can find it. And uh, please do, when you subscribe, you can do uh, comments too. And we love that. Tell us where you're from. We try to image on a clear night once a week at least. This time we've done three different programs, three different nights out these last three nights in a row. Now we're going to hit a cloudy patch, so we'll be gone for a while. But uh, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, thanks to God for making beautiful images like this VDB1, all this uh, cool glow between these three ninth magnitude stars. Uh, it just makes for a beautiful image and gives us such great stuff to look at. So. Thank you, God, for making these, and thank you for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you. Larry, you stuck with us the whole time. Curtis, my goodness, you're still with us as well. Kim, thanks for joining us from down in Australia. Uh, we love you guys. Thanks for sticking with us, and we'll say good night. God bless. Good night from Emerald Hills Skies. <laughs>